Welcome to the Dream Power Show. I'm your host, Debbie Spector Weissman, the Dream Coach. When I first began my study of dream work, I didn't know everything about what we can learn from these visions in the night. I started by focusing on individual dreams, one at a time, getting some insights about what I thought they were telling me, and that was that. But over time, I realized that dreams actually open up a fascinating new world for us, and not only help us, but heal us, inspire us, and so much more. We're going to dive into all aspects of dream work with my guest, Laurel Clark. Laurel is a dreamologist who's been teaching about dreams for years and has authored numerous books, including Intuitive Dreaming, and has contributed to many more, including the Encyclopedia of Sleep and Dreams. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Laurel. Thanks, Debbie. It's great to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Laurel, when did you first realize that dreams were important to you? You know, I think... As far back as I can remember, I was aware of dreams. I mean, I remember dreams that I had as a young child before I was even in kindergarten in terms of learning what those dreams were telling me. That started when I was in college and I was going to a counselor who had a Gestalt background. And so we worked with my dreams in therapy. And then from there, I have attended schooling for years to learn about how to interpret dreams, my own, as well as helping other people with theirs. Mm. So you wrote a book called Intuitive Dreaming. What do you mean by intuitive dreaming? So that's a great question. There are some dreams that people consider everyday dreams that are symbolic, in my opinion, dreaming about other people, that the dream isn't really about another person, it's about an aspect of ourselves that that person represents. Intuitive dreaming, some people call extraordinary dreams. So for example, when someone dies, they can come to visit us in the dream state or we can visit them. So it is an actual visit or meeting with that spirit who's no longer in physical form that's one type of intuitive dream. Having a telepathic dream where somebody who is still alive is thinking something and we are aware of what they are thinking in our dream state. Clairvoyant dreams, being able to perceive or see clairvoyantly something that's happening maybe in another part of the world. Uh, precognitive dreams, which is dreaming about the probable future. So all of those sometimes called extraordinary dreams, sometimes they're called side dreams, spelled PSI, which are more than symbolic experiences. How common do you think these type of dreams are? You know, I believe personally that everybody has some dream like that at least once in their life. I think that they are probably more common than many people realize. And the reason that I say that is when I talk about visitation dreams, I've had two very powerful visitation dreams after my husband died. When I talk about those every single time, no matter who I'm with, somebody says, oh my gosh, I had a dream like that too. I dreamt of somebody who had died. And sometimes they have never talked about it before because they don't want somebody to talk them out of it or to say, oh, that was just wish fulfillment. And so that's why I think they're more common than people realize is that sometimes people don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I bet when you do reveal your dreams to these people, they get some sort of peace or you know, closure out of that also. Yes, I think so. I mean, there's something about the inner experience that's very comforting. It's usually very centering. And I think that having a true visitation dream, the dreamer knows that it was a visitation, that it wasn't just their imagination or they weren't just making it up. And so having somebody who can affirm that is very helpful to people. 
uh, when you had the visitation dreams uh, about your husband, uh, I imagine at that point you were already uh, aware of what it was when it happened, or was it something that surprised you? Well, the first dream that I had, first of all, let me say that my husband also knew about dreams. And before he died, we had a long distance relationship for a while. And so we actually used to play around with meeting each other in our dreams. We would call it dream dates. We would decide on a certain night that we were going to meet in our dreams. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So we had already established a very strong telepathic connection and a strong connection with our dreams. And when he died, I wasn't there. We didn't have a chance to say goodbye. And I just thought he would come to me in a dream so that we could have a, a goodbye closure. And when that didn't happen, I can't remember exactly how long it was, maybe a month, maybe six weeks after he died. I actually asked for him to come to me in a dream. I, I wrote him a very uh, heartfelt letter in my dream journal kind of pleading to him to come to me in a dream state. And the dream I had that night, I was at a graduation ceremony and I saw a stage that was kind of far off and there were a group of people sitting in a semicircle on the stage. And I saw him there and I couldn't tell if he saw me or not. I knew that I saw him. And then as the dream was ending, this man who I don't know came up to me and handed me my Bible that apparently I'd left sitting on the edge of the stage. And when I picked it up, this little piece of paper fluttered out and on it was a heart that was in John's handwriting. And I knew that that was his way of telling me that he loved me. And I also knew, and this was very interesting, that the reason he had not come to me before that in a dream is that he was still graduating as it were to this existence on the other side and he didn't yet have the ability to communicate verbally. So when you're asking if it was surprising, how that dream happened was surprising because I was expecting we would you know, meet, we would hug each other, we would get to say the things we hadn't had to say. What I wasn't expecting that bittersweet kind of experience, but it was very affirming because I knew that he heard me. I knew that he loved me. I hadn't had any doubt about that. And I also knew that I just needed to be patient to give him time to get adjusted to this existence on the other side. That's fascinating. And, you know, I'm fascinated by what you said about that he had to graduate to be able to, to speak to you or, or to reveal himself in your dreams. It is an amazing view into what the other side looks like. Mm -hmm. In my opinion and perception, I think that when people die, it's a similar experience to being born. You know, if you think about a baby that's born into a body, there's a soul and a spirit that's very much alive, but they're not used to their body. They have to figure out, oh, this hand is actually attached to me and how to, you know, be able to use it and move around in it. And I think a similar process happens after death is that there's a different kind of body that somebody moves into that they need to get used to. Mm, that is fascinating. And uh, you talked about how you were able to you know, have a telepathic relationship with your husband. Uh, is it possible to have telepathic dreams with other people who you might not even know or have a strong bond with? I think so. I know a couple of people who actually met their future spouses in a dream before they met them in waking life. And in both cases, the people who had the dream recognized the spouse who they hadn't met yet in waking life. And they even knew that that person was going to be their spouse. So I definitely think that can happen. I know that um, it is not uncommon for somebody to 
either they might consider it hearing a voice or they might see a name written out of somebody they don't recognize. And then later on in waking life, they have the actual encounter. Mm. Yeah, I know, uh, you know we're both members of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And I know that they've done contests where person A dreams to person B and person B to person C and then back to person A. Uh, are, are, have, have you been involved in that or can you speak about it? Yes, that? actually, the last time there was an in-person conference, I won the dream telepathy contest. And there used to be an online conference called Cyber Dreaming, which is a, a pun, P-S-I-B-E-R, Dreaming. It was an online conference that was two weeks long and they had dream telepathy contests. And um, I never won first place, but I won some honorable mentions and a, a third place in one of those contests. So I love dream telepathy. I love waking telepathy also. So is this a skill that can be learned? Yes, it is. And I think it starts with people learning how to cause their minds to be still, to allow there to be some quiet time and to allow that interior silence to be there to give us the opportunity to hear and receive and perceive what is other than our own mind, which in this day and age is pretty challenging because there are so many stimuli for us to be on 24 seven. And so it requires some conscious choice to say, I'm going to sit in silence without listening to a guided imagery without having the TV on, without uh, having any kind of external input. It, it is possible. I mean, I, I've uh, had challenges where uh, I've been asked to be or imagine silence you know, for a minute. And even that is a difficult uh, goal to get to, uh, but it is, it is learnable, it is teachable. Um, I want to turn to the idea of precognitive dreams. Uh, tell me how you work with people who've had precognitive dreams. Well, first of all, I do want to say that I believe that the future is always probability. It's not predestined. And the reason that I think that's important is that sometimes somebody will have a dream of something that they consider a disaster, like they dream about uh, somebody who they know dies and then that person actually dies. And then the dreamer sometimes is afraid, oh my gosh, did I cause that because I dreamed about it. And I do not think that we cause things to happen by dreaming about them. I do think it's possible to dream of future probabilities. So, one way that I work with people is, first of all, to realize that if the dream is about themselves, if it's something that they want to have happen, it can help them be prepared for it. If it's something they don't want to have happen, then they can look to see, is there something I can change about this? So a simple, not life or death example with myself, some years ago, I was elected to become president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And at the annual conference of this organization, the incoming and outgoing president give a speech. So I had a dream that I was at this conference, I was at the meeting, I was listening to the previous speaker and all of a sudden realized, oh my gosh, I don't have my notes with me. And in the dream, I was trying to figure out, do I have time to run back to my hotel room and get my notes or can I just wing it? And I woke up feeling kind of panicked. And fortunately I had the wisdom to, uh, I emailed someone I know who is also a longtime member of this organization who's very wise. And she also um, is a big proponent of mutual dreaming 
And she said, you know, sometimes we have precognitive dreams so that we can change the future. That was all she said. And I thought, okay, here's I, how I can prepare for this. First of all, I made three copies of my notes and I put them in three different places. And I rehearsed the speech enough that I could be able to give it without having to rely upon my notes. So somebody might hear that and say, well, that wasn't a precognitive dream because it didn't happen. You didn't you know, show up at the meeting without your notes. And I believe that had I not had that dream, that might have happened, but because I had it and listened to it and reached out to someone else who gave me some advice, then I was able to change the future. How can people find out more about you and your services? Well, thank you so much for the interview, Debbie. They can connect with me on my website, which is my name, laurelclark.com, or they can email me at laurel at laurelclark.com. And I would love to hear from anyone and um, talk more about dreams. I do individual dream work with people if they're interested in that also. We've been speaking with dreamologist Laurel Clark.